Chapter Six of the Romance of a Christmas Card. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Allison Hester. The Romance of a Christmas Card by Kate Douglas Wiggins. Chapter Six. On the afternoon before Christmas of that year, the North Station in Boston was filled with hurrying throngs on the way home for the holidays. Everybody looked tired and excited, but most of them had happy faces, and men and women alike had as many bundles as they could carry, bundles and boxes quite unlike the brown paper ones with which commuters are laden on ordinary days. These were white packages, beribboned and beflowered and behollied and be mistletoed to be gently carried and protected from crushing. The train was filled to overflowing, and many stood in the aisles until Latham Junction was reached and the overflow alighted to change cars for Greentown and way stations. Among the crowd were two men with suitcases who hurried into the way train and entering the smoking car from opposite ends, met in the middle of the aisle, dropped their encumbrances, stretched out a hand, and ejaculated in the same breath, Dick Larrabee, upon my word! Dave Gilman, by all that's great! Here, let's turn over a seat for our baggage and sit together. Going home, I suppose? The men had not met for some years, but each knew something of the other's circumstances, and hoped that the other didn't know too much. They scanned each other's faces, Dick thinking that David looked pinch and pale, David half-heartedly registering the quick impression that Dick was prosperous. Yes, David answered, I'm going home for a couple of days. It's such a confounded journey to that one-horse village that a businessman can't get there but once in a generation. Awful hole, confirmed Dick, simply awful hole. I didn't get it out of my system for years. Married? asked David. No, rather think I'm not the marrying kind, though the fact is I've had no time for love affairs. Too busy. Let's see. You have a child, haven't you? Yes, Letty has seen to all that business for me since my wife died. Wild horses couldn't have dragged the information from him that the child was twins, and Dick didn't need it anyway, for he had heard the news the morning he left Beulah. Wonder if there have been many changes in the village. Don't know. There never used to be. Mrs. Popham has been ailing for years. She couldn't die. And Deacon Todd wouldn't. Dick's old animosity still lingered faintly in his memory, though his laughing voice and the twinkle in his eyes showed plainly that no bitterness was left. How's business with you, David? Only so-so. I've had the devil's own luck lately. Can't get anything that suits me or pays a decent income. I formed a new connection the other day, but I can't say yet what there is in it. I am just out of the hospital. Operation. They cut out the wrong thing first, I believe. Sewed me up absent-mindedly, then remembered it was the other thing, and did it over again. At any rate, that's the only way I can account for their mewing me up there for two months. Well, well, that is hard luck. I'm sorry, old boy. Things didn't begin to go my way either, till within the last few months. I've always made a fair living and saved a little money, but never gained any real headway. Now I've got a first-rate start, and the future looks pretty favorable, and best of all, pretty safe. No trouble at home calls you back to Beulah. I hope Letty is all right. Dick cast an anxious side glance at David, though he spoke carelessly. Oh, no, everything's serene, so far as I know. I'm a poor correspondent, especially when I've no good news to tell. And anyway, the mere sight of a pen ties my tongue. I'm just running down to surprise Letty. Dick looked at David again. He began to think he didn't like him. He used to when they were boys, but when he brought that unaccountable wife home and foisted her and her babies on Letty, he rather turned against him. David was younger than himself, four or five years younger, but he looked as if he hadn't grown up. Surely his boyhood chum hadn't used to be so pale and thin-chested, or his mouth so ladylike and pretty. A good face, though, 
straight and clean, with honest eyes and a likable smile. Lack of will, perhaps, or a persistent run of ill luck. Letty had always kept him stiffened up in the old days. Dick recalled one of his father's phrases to the effect that Dave Gilman would spin on a very small biscuit, and wondered if it were still true. "'And you, Dick? Your father's still living? You see, I haven't kept up with Beulah lately.' "'Keeping up with Beulah. It sounds like the title of a novel, but the hero would have to be a snail, or he'd pass Beulah in the first chapter. Yes, father's hale and hearty, I believe.' "'You come home every Christmas, I suppose?' inquired David. "'No. As a matter of fact, this is my first visit since I left for good.' "'That's about my case.' And David hung his head a little, unconsciously. "'That so. Well, I was a hot-headed fool when I said good-bye to Beulah, and it's taken me all this time to cool off and make up my mind to apologize to the dead. There's—' There's rather a queer coincidence about my visit just at this time. Speaking of coincidences, said David, I can beat yours, whatever it is. If the thought of your father brought you back, my mother drew me this way. And he took something from his inside coat pocket. Do you see that? Dick regarded the object blankly, then with a quick gesture dived into his pocket and brought forth another of the same general character. "'How about this?' he asked. Each had one of Reba Larrabee's Christmas cards, but David had the first unsuccessful one, and Dick the popular one, with the lonely little gray house, and the verse about the folks back home. The men looked at each other in astonishment, and Dick gave a low whistle. Then they bent over the cards together. It was Mother's picture that pulled me back to Beulah. I don't mind telling you, said David, his mouth twitching. Don't you see it? Oh, is that your mother? And Dick scanned the card closely. Don't you remember her portrait that always hung there after she died? Yes, of course. And Dick's tone was apologetic. You see, the face is so small I didn't notice it. But I recognize it now and remember the portrait. Then the old sitting room, exclaimed David. Look at the rag carpet and the blessed old andirons. Gracious, I've crawled round those Hessian soldiers, burned my fingers and cracked my skull on them often enough when I was a kid. When I'd studied the card five minutes, I bought a ticket and started for home. David's eyes were suffused and his lip trembled. I don't wonder, said Dick. I recognized the dear old room right enough, and of course I should know Letty. It didn't occur to me that it was Letty for some time, said her brother. There's just a glimpse of a face shown, and no real likeness. Perhaps not, agreed Dick. A stranger wouldn't have known it for Letty, but if it had been only that cape, I should have guessed. It's as familiar as Mrs. Popham's bugle bonnet and much prettier. She wore it every winter, skating, you know, and it's just the color of her hair. Letty has a good-shaped head, said David judiciously. It shows, even in the card. And a remarkable ear, remarked Dick, so small and so close to her head. I never notice people's ears, confessed David. Don't you? I do, and eyelashes, too. Mother's got Letty's eyelashes down fine. She's changed, Dave. Letty has. That hurts me. She was always so gay and chirpy. In this picture, she has a sad, far-away, listening look. But Mother may have put that in just to make it interesting. Or, perhaps I've had something to do with the change of expression, thought David. What attracted me first, he added, was your mother's verses. She always had a knack of being pious without cramming piety down your throat. I liked that open door. It meant welcome, no matter how little you deserved it. Where'd you get your card, Dave? asked Dick. It's prettier than mine. A nurse brought it to me in the hospital, just because she took a fancy to it. She didn't know it would mean anything to me, but it did. A relapse. And David laughed shamefacedly. I guess she'll confine herself to beef tea after this. Where'd you get yours? 
picked it up on a dentist's mantelpiece when I was waiting for an appointment. I was traveling round the room, hands in my pocket, when suddenly I saw this card standing up against an hourglass. The color caught me. I took it to the window, and at first I was puzzled. It certainly was Letty's house. The door's open, you see, and there's somebody in the window. I knew it was Letty, but how could any card publisher have found the way to Beulah? Then I discovered Mother's initials snarled up in Holly, and remembered that she was always painting and illuminating. "'Queer job life is,' said David, putting his card back in his pocket, and wishing there were a little more time, or that he had a little more courage, so that he might confide in Dick Larrabee. He felt a desire to tell him some of the wretchedness he had lived through, it would be a comfort just to hint that his unhappiness had made him a coward, so that the very responsibilities that serve as a spur to some men had left him until now cold, unstirred, unvitalized. "'You're right,' Dick answered. "'Life is a queer job, and it doesn't do to shirk it. And just as queer as anything in life is the way that Mother's Christmas cards brought us back to Beulah. They acted as a sort of magic, didn't they?' Jiminy, I believe the next station is Beulah. I hope the depot team will be hitched up. Yes, here we are, seven o'clock in the train, only thirty-five minutes late. It always made a point of that on holidays. Never mind, and Dick's tone was as gay as David's was sober. The bean pot will have gone back to the cellarway and the doughnuts to the crock, but the folks back home will get them out for us, and a mince pie, too and a cut of sage cheese. There won't be any folks back home. We're so late, I'm thinking. There's always a Christmas Eve festival at the church, you know. They never change, in Beulah. Then by George, they can have me for Santa Claus, said Dick as they stepped out on the platform. Why, it doesn't seem cold at all. Yet, look at that ice on the river. What skating, and what a moon. My blood's up, and if I find the parsonage closed, I'll follow on to the church and make my peace with the members. There's a kind of spell on me. For the first time in years, I feel as though I could shake hands with Deacon Todd. Well, Merry Christmas to you, Dick. I'm going to walk. Good gracious, have you come to spend the winter? For various bags and parcels were being flung out on the platform, with that indifference and irresponsibility that bespeak the touch of the seasoned baggage handler. You didn't suppose I was coming back to Beulah empty-handed on Christmas Eve, did you? If I'm in time for the tree, I'm going to give those blue-nosed, frost-bitten little youngsters something to remember. Jump in, Dave, and ride as far as the turn of the road. In a few minutes, the tottering old signboard that marked the way to Beulah Center hove in sight, and David jumped from the sleigh to make his homeward path. Merry Christmas again, Dick, he waved. Same to you, Dave. I'll come myself to say it to Letty the first minute I see smoke coming from your chimney tomorrow morning. Tell her you met me, will you, and that my visit is partly for her. Only that father had to have his turn first. She'll know why. Tell her mother's card had Christmas magic in it. Tell, say, tell her the rest yourself, will you, Dick? And Dave broke into a run down the hill that led to Letty. I will indeed, breathed Dick into his muffler. End of chapter 6